And uh, what, what we're talking about now, and really will be for most of the rest of the semester, is water flooding. So if we have a reservoir, and I can draw it any way I want, okay, and this is of course gonna be three-dimensional, have varying thickness and stuff like that. This is our reservoir, and we, we can be producing fluids, all right? And I might draw an arrow for a producing well. And so we're gonna be producing at a rate, but, uh, but also you can have injectors, okay? You can, we'll talk about patterns for these wells and stuff like that later, but, but over here you're producing oil and water, maybe gas, and you're gonna be injecting water, at least for now, we're doing water flooding. You can inject other things and enhanced oil recovery, which we've talked about, but for now we're gonna be talking about water flooding. And so you're going to be injecting water and producing oil. And you'll produce oil and, um, and water. And so the idea is, is that you stick water into the reservoir, it pushes the oil out through the producer well. And um, this is a generic three-dimensional reservoir. Now I should, should like to point out that when we produce uh, during secondary recovery or, or, or a specific type of secondary recovery is water flooding, um, you're going to produce a lot of oil, okay, especially early on. Uh, but you're also going to leave behind a lot of oil, okay. So uh, as a general rule, and this is just a rule of thumb, every reservoir is different, okay. But, but as a good rule of thumb, you might only produce a third of the oil in place from a water flood. Uh, could be less than that, could sometimes be more than that, but a third on that order of magnitude is, is fairly common. That means you leave behind two thirds. And this is after decades of water flooding. So you can be doing a water flood for 20, 30, 40 years and still two thirds of the oil is left behind. So I, I wanna talk about that, that oil that's left behind because it's split up into two different kinds. So the first kind of oil left behind is residual oil or SOR, right? We're familiar with that. This is capillary trapped oil. Okay, so um, capillary trapped oil is pretty much unproducible, at least from a water flood. So if I were to do a water flood for uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, I would never produce this residual oil. It's due to capillary forces and interfacial tension, things about that you learned about in petrophysics, and that's the SOR. So if SOR is 30%, 0.3, then that means that 30% of the oil in place will never get out, okay? Um, at least with a water flow. There are things you could do. Uh, that's what tertiary recovery is about, enhanced oil recovery. So you can inject detergents, soaps, we call them surfactants. They reduce the interfacial tension, decrease the capillary forces, and then you could produce that. But that's expensive, and that's only something we do in enhanced oil or tertiary recovery. But in water flooding, that capillary trapped oil, we're not gonna produce. It doesn't matter how long you wait. The other kind I'm gonna refer to is unswept or bypassed oil. And that's time dependent. Okay, and that's due to an unfavorable mobility ratio. We talked about what mobility is, is the relative permeability divided by the viscosity of the phase. And so the mobility ratio is the ratio of those. And so if you have a poor mobility ratio, an example would be if you have a heavy oil and a low, a very viscous oil and a low viscosity water fluid, then what you get is what's called viscous fingering or by or that, that's one example. So what you might do is you might inject over here and what might happen is that this is water and this is oil and then the water will get to the producer well and then you'll start producing water, not much oil. So the water bypasses the oil. It's because it's got a um, higher mobility and, and, and it's less viscous, okay? And so that water will reach will bypass the oil and reach the producer, and then you're producing most and maybe even all water, right? And so, um, now, it's de time dependent. So, usually what will happen 
is that you will get or the additional oil eventually and you'll get this out but you might have to wait hundreds or thousands of years which is of course not practical and so uh, again as a general rule maybe you produce a third maybe a third of it is residual oil maybe a third is unswept oil okay um, to get the unswept oil we might have to be clever about our well placements and um, and, uh, and, and evaluate our mobility ratios for residual oil. It's going to be trapped there forever unless we use something like surfactants. By the way, you can do things in enhanced oil recovery as well for, to produce unswept oil. So you can use viscous polymers, for example. And then that, the viscous polymers are much less likely to bypass the oil like water is because they're more viscous. And so if one of the things we talked about is the poor volume or the poor volume. And so the poor volume is, is the bulk volume times the porosity. And if it's a rectangle, then it would be L H W V, right? L is the length, H is the thickness, W is the width. And, you know, I'm thinking my little, uh, sponge here is being a reservoir, right? So it's got a length, a width, and a thickness, and then it's got a porosity. And so that's the pore volumes. And we'll awful, often talk about pore volumes injected. We'll get more to this later, pore volumes injected. It's like a dimensionless time. So it's Q over the pore volume, so I'm going to write that as VP, times T. Right, so Q is a rate per time times time is a you know is a volume per time times the time is a volume. This is the pore volume, and so that's the pore volumes injected. And then the other thing we might do is we can, if you were to make a plot of these things, then you, know, you were to plot the dimensionless oil recovery. This is NPD is the volume oil recovered divided by the pour volume. Okay, that's NPD. So this is basically the percent, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, um, that you recover. If you were to make a plot versus time or dimensionless time, I'm going to call that PVI, pour volumes injected, what you'll get is you'll get a straight line. This has actually got a 45 degree angle, so NPD is equal to pore volumes injected. What that means is that for every barrel of water you put, put into an injector, it displaces oil and produces a barrel of oil. That's, you know, and that's about right, right? So, so you you know, if, if compressibility is not a big thing, and, and compressibility is really important during primary recovery, but it's not during secondary recovery, basically you put in a barrel of one fluid and you produce a barrel of the other. That happens early on. Early on, you, you, you inject over here, far away from the producer, you inject that barrel water, and it produces a barrel of oil over here. Okay, or you inject a thousand barrels of water and you produce a thousand barrels of oil. So this is the dimensionless oil recovery versus dimensionless time, and it's a nice straight line. So if this is 0.2, then this is 0.2, okay? But then something happens. At some point, you've got the breakthrough time. I'll call this BT, breakthrough time. And when the breakthrough time happens, all of a sudden, you start producing both water and oil. So some of that water you're injecting is bypassing the oil and reaching the producer, and then it, it starts producing. So even though you might inject one barrel of water and produce one barrel of something, that something is both oil and water. So if we're talking about oil recovery, what happens is, is this flattens out and reaches an asymptote. And this asymptote is one minus the residual oil saturation minus the residual water saturation. Okay, and so this is what a typical plot looks like. 
This is a nice straight line with a 45 degree angle. After breakthrough, it starts to level off. And this leveling off could be really fast or slow depending on your, your mobility ratio, right? So it could be really bad and it could do like this, could be better and do like that and get there faster. That depends on the mobility ratio and that, that depends on things that we'll talk about. If I were to plot the oil rate versus time, or dimensionless time, I should say. Well, if I'm injecting at a constant water rate, then the oil rate might be constant. And then all of a sudden, the oil rate will decrease. Or likewise, if uh, the water rate QW will be zero till a breakthrough time and then it will increase. Okay. So NPD, that's our dimensionless oil recovery, is going to be, we're going to use this formula all semester. E D A A I E A E I times S O I minus S O R. S O I is the initial oil saturation, right? So you're going to have some residual or irreducible water saturation. So that might be 70, 80%, 90%, something like that. And S O R is the oil that you'll never recover. So that will be 10, 20, 30. 40%, something like that. So this is SOR, that's the capillary trapped oil. So this is, you know, due, due to this is um, oil eventually recovered. Okay. Okay, so if you were to inject water for an infinite amount of period of time, this is the amount of oil you get. This would be NPD. All of these would be one. But these, these are unswept oil, okay? So ED is what's called displacement efficiency. And we're gonna talk about that first. Okay, and that occurs even in a 1D type flood. EA is aerial displacement. Efficiency. And EI is the vertical displacement efficiency. Vertical displacement efficiency. And let me describe EA and EI a little bit. So EA occurs in two dimensions. And if you had an injector well over here and a producer well over here, then maybe what the water does is something like this. So this is water and this is oil. So the oil that doesn't get produced over here at some given time is due to aerial displacement efficiency. So it creates these fingering maps, which we'll talk about. This is EA. EI is vertical displacement efficiency. So it has to do with vertical layers. So let's say you had permeabilities K1, K2, and K3, and K4. And let's say that you had an injector here and a producer over here. And let's say that K2 is the most permeable. Well, what would happen is that water would flow more easily there than in these other layers. And, um, and then you have some time dependence of recovery over there, okay? And then really, once the water reaches the producer, it's just going to zoom right through um, that layer. So this is vertical displacement efficiency. And many times, these two things are combined and called volumetric displacement efficiency. We'll be talking about those all semester. But today, I'm going to be talking about, in, for the next probably couple of weeks, I'll be talking about displacement efficiency, ED. And that occurs even in one dimension, okay? So we're gonna start simple. We're gonna be talking about 
a 1D reservoir or a 1D core. My students do experiments in the lab all the time with one foot long rock cores. And it's a one dimensional flood. It could be flat or it could be at an angle, a dip angle, like on your exam, it could be vertical. Okay, but it's one dimension. And we're only talking about oil and water for now. So there's no gas phase. I mean, of course, there could be gas dissolved in the oil, but there's no gas phase. The only two phases are the aqueous or water phase and the oleic or the, the oil phase. And so what I'll usually have is SOI is equal to one minus SWR. Doesn't have to be like that, but, but for our purposes it will be. So the only water that we have in there is irreducible water. So maybe how we got that is that we had a rock full of water and then we injected oil for a really long time and then we came to steady state and the only thing that was left was the residual oil, residual water saturation. So for example, maybe you have 10% water and 90% oil. So SOI is 0.9. And then what I'll do is I'll inject water. And over here, I'll produce oil. Okay, well, I'll produce oil early on, but eventually I'll produce oil plus water. I don't want to produce water, but eventually I will. And that's due to some sort of bypassing or unswept oil. I'm going to do a mass balance on this. You've done lots of mass balances in your transport class and reservoir engineering class. And if we, this is one dimension. This is the area A. This is some delta X here. Then we can write a mass balance on this control volume, on this volume. Okay, so anything that goes in minus anything that goes out is what's accumulated. So the way I can write that balance, I can do it for both water and oil. Okay, so I'll do it for water first, but the oil is going to be exactly the same. So the mass is going to be, that goes in as the density of water times the volumetric flow rate of water. This is in the x direction, that's why I put a subscript x, times delta t. That's what goes in, right? This is position x and this is position x plus delta x. And let me check my units. Density is units of mass per unit volume. Flow rate as units of volume per time. Okay, so that means I got mass per time and then I multiply by some time interval delta t. So that gives me mass. So mass in pounds or kilograms. That's what goes in. And then what goes out is the density of water times the flow rate at x plus delta x also times that delta t. Okay, so the reason why it's at x plus delta x is because it comes out downstream, you know, delta x um, downstream because this is the size of the sliver is delta x. So this is the mass that goes in, this is the mass that comes out. You can have mass accumulated though. Right, you can have compressibility of your fluids in your rock, and you know this is water. So what, what could be happening is that water could be increasing and oil could be decreasing. So um, what we want to do is is set that equal to what is accumulated. So a balance is always in minus out is equal to accumulation. So we wrote our in minus out term. Now let's write our accumulation term. So the accumulation is the mass at some future time, delta t, minus the mass now. So you've got a certain amount of mass of water in pounds or kilograms. And then at some delta t in the future, you'll either have more or less water, maybe, unless you're at steady state. And so well, what is the mass of water? Well, it's the pore volume of water times the saturation of water, that would give us the volume of water, times the density of water. So what I can do is I can say that's the density of water times the saturation of water, 
times the pore volume, which is really the porosity times the bulk volume. I'll say that that's delta V. That's at T plus delta T minus rho W, S W, V, delta V at T. So here's my balance. This is, this is the mass of water that goes into the control volume, my little sliver there, minus the mass that comes out is equal to the accumulation. And the accumulation is that the mass of water at T plus delta T minus the mass of water at T. And um, if I recall that the volume delta V is the cross-sectional area times delta X, and I divide by A delta X times delta T, then what I get, and oh, I should point out one other thing, that Q, the rate, is the velocity times the area. U is the Darcy velocity. Then what I'm left with is density of water times the velocity of water in the x direction minus the density of water times the velocity of water in the x plus delta x direction divided by delta x. Okay. Why is that? Because I divided through by A delta x delta t. So the delta t's cancel, delta t divided by delta t. Q divided by A is just the velocity, but then I got a delta x on the denominator. On the right hand side, A delta x is the delta v, so those will cancel. So then what I'm left with on the right hand side is the density of water times the porosity times the saturation, T plus delta T, minus the density porosity times the saturation at T, all divided by delta T. Okay, so if you don't quite see that, go through the math and make sure you understand it yourself. Now, all these things could change with time. The density of water could be different now than it is in a few seconds. The porosity could be different, and that's because the fluid is compressible. It might be slightly compressible, but it's compressible. The rock is slightly compressible. That's why the porosity could change. And certainly the water saturation could change. After all, I'm injecting water. So I bet my water saturation will go up with time in my control volume. Okay. And then I could do one last thing. Okay, I'm going to do some calculus here. I'm going to take the limit as delta t goes to zero. And the limit as delta x goes to zero. And we know from calculus that when we take the limit as delta, there's the denominator delta x goes to zero or delta t goes to zero, what we get is a derivative. Okay, and so what uh, that's gonna look like is really a partial derivative because we've got an x component and a time component. And so what I'm left with is there is a negative sign here. This is a water balance. Yeah, there you go. So this is a water balance. Uh, I apologize for my handwriting. These are not twos, they're partial derivatives. So it's the partial with respect to x of the density times the velocity is equal to the partial with respect to time, this is a parenthesis, times the density of water times the porosity times the saturation. This is what we call a partial differential equation. It's a partial differential equation because it's dependent on more than one variable, both x and time which is different from an uh, ordinary differential equation. That was our water balance. You could go through the exactly the same exercise for an oil balance. And if I did that, it would look almost identical, except I'm gonna use subscripts O for oil. So this is
my oil balance. And by the way, we know that SO plus SW is one. There's no gas. Saturation of S, but so if I wanted to, I could have substituted SO and written one minus SW. So, you know, I know that sometimes partial differential equations in particular could be intimidating. We start seeing these partial derivatives and it's complicated. Uh, try not to overthink it. These are just balances. And all this says, the left-hand side says, this is the mass of water in minus out over an incrementally small control volume size, delta x. And this is the accumulation that occurs with time. And again, if we want to be rigorous, the density can change with time, the porosity can change with time, and the saturation can change with time. And that's why the mass of water now might be different than what it is at some point in the future. And likewise, the density and the velocity can vary with position. Okay. And the second one is just the oil balance, which is really the same equation, but, but it's for oil. So we use the superscript oil. What... Um, what we often do as reservoir engineers is that we solve these PDEs to determine what the velocity and the pressure is of the water in the oil phase everywhere and ultimately what the oil recovery is. Remember if you go back to the first day of class I told you that what our job, what our goal is as reservoir engineers is to make predictions. It's to predict the future and it's we do that with math. We solve these equations and we predict what the velocity is of water and oil at different locations, especially at the well where we get production. These equations look complicated, and they are, but they get more complicated. Remember, this is in one dimension. We got, just with x, we could have a y and a z, and then it's got four variables, x, y, z, and time. These are really only two phases, water and oil. You could have a third phase, gas. Those equations are really hard to do, so much so that it is impossible to solve exactly, or what we call analytically. In PG310, you learn some numerical methods, some approximate ways of solving problems. And that's normally what we do as reservoir engineers, is that we have to write complicated code, maybe in Python, to solve these equations. And the subdiscipline of reservoir engineering that does that is called reservoir simulation. Many of you will take reservoir simulation with Dr. Foster as an elective, and, and I encourage it. I taught that class for many years. But those numerical solutions, those approximate solutions, are beyond the scope of this class. And I will say that there is a special situation where we can solve these analytically. That situation is only two phases, water and oil like we're talking about. Only one dimension, x direction, uh, you know, along the, the length of flow, and, and a few others. So I'll talk about those now. So we're going to call this the Buckley Leverett theory for 1D displacement. And so what Buckley Leverett is, is it's a semi-analytical solution for water saturation. Okay but it's in 1D. And um, why do we do this, okay? So if I'm, if I'm being completely accurate, uh, we're gonna make some assumptions here which are, I would say that they're almost never completely true. Sometimes they're approximately true, but, but they're never completely true. And, and it's in only one dimension. And so what's the, what's the purpose? Well, th there's two purposes. One, uh, even though those assumptions are not completely true, they're often approximately true, and it really gives us a really good understanding of 
how water displaces oil and how production works and it allows us to make some pretty good predictions of things under certain circumstances. And it's a good way to start things, maybe before you go to reservoir simulation or something. The other place that this is useful for is to benchmark or to verify your numerical simulation. So anytime we write code and have a numerical simulator, we want to make sure that it's right. One way to do that is to compare it to a solution that we know is correct, like the Buckley-Leverett solution. Some of the assumptions in the Buckley-Leverett model By the way, most of this that I'm writing down is on the PowerPoint notes, and we'll review that next time, but I like to write things out first. So some of them are two-phase flow. Okay, in our case, oil and water. So it's two immiscible phases. Okay, if you had a third phase, then you couldn't use this. Another is one-dimensional flow. Okay, so this doesn't apply in two dimensions or three dimensions, and of course most reservoirs are 2D and 3D. But um, a lot of the experiments we do in the lab are 1D, and, um, and we can learn a lot from this even in 1D. There are some reservoirs that you can approximate as 1D. If you line up a bunch of injectors and you line up a bunch of producers, and that's sometimes done, and you do a water flood that way, then it's approximately 1D. Here's a big one. Incompressible fluids, and I should say in rock. Okay. Now this is a, this almost seems like a weird assumption. It's weird to me because when I taught Reservoir 1, primary recovery, I emphasized how important the compressibility of water and oil are. You know, I'm a chemical engineering by training, and they always taught me when I was an undergrad that, that water and liquids are incompressible. That's not true. They are slightly compressible. They're not as compressible as gases, but they are slightly compressible. And in reservoirs where the volume is huge, that compressibility is really important for primary recovery. That's really the only, or really the main reason why we get recovery at all during primary recovery is because as the pressure changes, as the pressure drops, the fluids expand and then are produced. That's during primary recovery though. In secondary recovery, water refill up flooding, compressibility doesn't have much of an impact. And so for the majority of this semester, I'll be neglecting compressibility. I'll be saying that the density of the fluid is constant with time, and the porosity is constant with time. And if you go back to my equations over here, I originally wrote the density and the porosity inside the time derivative. But if I make that approximation, going to be able to take these and pull them out. It's not entirely true, but the change in density and the change in porosity with time is usually so much smaller than the change in water saturation with time. And the last one will be no capillary pressure. So that means that PW is equal to PO. Okay. And because of that, I'll just write that as P, the pressure. So what do we have? We've got um, a one-dimensional reservoir, a one-dimensional rock core. We have some sort of initial oil saturation, which is might be 1 minus SWR. Okay. Um, so SO is equal to SWI, and maybe SW is equal to SWR. Technically, it could be greater than that, but most of the time, we're going to say that the water saturation is equal to the irreducible water saturation. Then we're going to inject water. Only going to inject water, right? We don't normally inject oil into reservoirs. No, it's not very economical. And on the other side, we produce, and I showed this earlier, oil, but eventually we'll produce water too. And in fact, early on, you'll produce only oil. Later on, you'll produce oil and water. And then if you keep on going, you're going to be producing almost all water and very little oil. And then it's not very economical anymore. Right? It doesn't make much sense. You're injecting water, you're producing water, you're just getting a little, few little drops of oil. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So at that point, 
if this were a reservoir, you would um, you would either do a tertiary recovery, you, you try to change things up, um, or do something else creative, um, or you might just try to sell the reservoir, right? So um, you inject water and you produce oil and eventually water as well. Anytime we solve a differential equation, whether it's an ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation, we always have initial and boundary conditions. That's the only way you can solve it. So you need an initial condition. So the initial condition is SW is given. So SW is equal to SWI, which doesn't have to be, but most of the time in this class is going to be SWR. So I stood for initial. And this is, you know, re residual or irreducible. Okay. So technically, you could have more water than 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 SWR. It could be higher than that, but um, but in our cases, we'll assume that it's SWR at least ninety five percent of the time in this class. That's an initial condition. Okay. Well, you need boundary conditions as well. Okay, and our boundary condition is that a constant injection rate, so QW is constant, okay, so you're only going to be ejecting water, and then the other one is constant production rate, Q, okay. And that could be water plus oil. Now I'd like to point out that the rate we inject is the rate that comes out. Why is that? What that means is there's no accumulation of total mass. Okay, so if you were to inject a thousand barrels per day of water, we're assuming you produce a thousand barrels per day of something oil plus water. And the reason why we can make that assumption is because we stated it earlier that we're assuming incompressible fluids are rock. If the compressibility was really high, th that wouldn't be true. You could inject a certain amount of fluid but produce less because it's compressing and it's accumulating in the, in the rock. But in our case, we said the fluids and the rock are incompressible. So if we stick in 1,000 1, barrels per day of water, then 1,000 barrels per day of something has to come out of the other side. That something is going to be all oil early on, later will be oil and water, and very late will be mostly water. If you apply those assumptions that we talked about, Then, with assumptions, you can, because the density and the porosity are constants, you can pull them out of the derivatives. Okay, so you can write the same thing for oil. And then what we see is that the densities can cancel. So now I'm left with partial respect to x of uw is equal to the porosity times the partial of st sw. So this is my water balance. I can also have an oil balance, which is the oil velocity there, v. Okay. So these are the same PDEs I showed a moment ago, but because the uh, densities were constants and because the uh, porosity was constant, I could pull them out of the derivatives and then the, the densities cancel. So this is water, this is oil, and what you can do is you can add them together to get a total balance. So total balance is water plus oil. 
So let me add these two equations together. If I add them together, I get partial with respect to x of uw plus uo. is equal to the porosity times the partial of st sw plus so. Okay, what does that mean? Well, sw plus so is always one. Okay, sw could be 0.3 and so could be 0.7, sw could be 0.6 and so could be 0.4, but they always add up to one. So the change with time of SW plus SO is zero. So this whole thing goes to zero. And then UW plus UO is U, right? UW plus UO is the total velocity U. So that means the partial with respect to X of U is zero. Or another way of thinking about it is the total velocity is not a function of X. All right, so there's no change in total velocity with x, it's equal to zero. Again, this is only for the assumptions that we made. So that means the total velocity in any position along your reservoir, or any position along your 1D rock core, is going to be constant. Be, you know, one foot per day or something. That doesn't mean that the water velocity and the oil velocity are constant. They can change. The water velocity could go up, the oil velocity could go down, or technically vice versa. But UW plus UO, U is going to be constant. And that's due to the, again, the incompressibility assumption of water and oil.